Good girl! Get it! Yay! Good morning! Happy Monday from Squeaky Kiri! Good girl! Hi, everybody. This is me, Anne, your host. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips. You had a very squeaky Monday. Good girl! Get that ball! Murder it! And uh, Kiri says, happy morning. Good girl. That's good girl. All right. I have to encourage her and get her all excited. Hey, whoa, what is my camera? Why are you so confused, camera? It was having a Monday. Apparently, my camera is also having a Monday. I hope it doesn't, like, die because I don't have an extra. <laughs> I should probably do that. I should probably acquire an extra um, Logitech mini cam, huh? Yes, much squeak. Much squeak. Okay, Kiri, can you settle? Or are you going to get a squeak? One more squeak? One more squeak? One more? What'd you do? Did you lose it? <laughs> She's hunting the ball under the blanket, I think. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, did you get it? Good girl. All right, settle down so we can start the show. You silly dog. Oh, she's so silly. Hello. Yes, silly girl. Yes, you're so silly. All right, good. So, whoa, my yeah, my cam is really like, hey, cam, whoa, no, don't space out on me, cam. I may have to do that. Oh, hey, Tashi, thanks for the resub. Yay. Super fantastic. Boing. Sweet. Yeah, thanks for the prime. Hello, everybody. We are back, more or less, on a Monday before Christmas. And, uh, yeah, so how's everybody doing? Like, is anybody doing presents this year? <laughs> We have a very festive um, Christmas bookshelf because we do not have room for a tree. So I got out my one string of lights and like festooned the bookshelf and everything is piled on top of the uh, the festive bookshelf. So I guess it's it's a good enough, right? David really likes it. So I, w I guess I win. <laughs> yeah. And happy solstice as well. Oh, wait, wait. Is it like... Dang it. I always hate it when I miss like texting my brother his happy birthday. And I totally did. But he's like, he never like is big on birthdays. So it's, it's weird. Like my family, like, I don't even know whether I'm supposed to send presents. <laughs> like for the kids, sure. For my niece and nephew. But like for the adults, like my brother's like, eh. but then his wife is like, well, you know, and it's like, oh, what do you do? Holiday awkwardness 101, right? But we get a short week this week. Um, no stream on uh, Thursday and Friday. So I get a long weekend where I will hopefully relax and enjoy myself. Hopefully. And bake a lot of cookies, which I've already been doing. But a chocolate, the chocolate um, sugar cookies are next, I think. Your presents are all in the mail? Yeah, I have to. I was really split because I didn't want to go out and hunt for gift cards. And I don't. The only store I go to when I get grocery shopping doesn't have gift cards. Um, so it's like I'll have to do them via email or do something. I don't know. Yeah, more lockdown. I saw that, Karuniko. I'm really sorry for you guys. I know California is really tight lockdown right now, too. That's why I'm not going out and why I'm not, like, running over to the pharmacy to get gift cards. Plus, who goes to a pharmacy during a plague? Like, there are sick people there. You know that there are. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Um, so anyway, you're making snickerdoodles. Ah, yeah, Amazon gift card. That's probably what's going to happen, D. Clearman. That's probably what's going to happen. It's just with the mail being so freaking late. And, uh, and everything else and, and not really getting, you know, my butt together because of everything going on. It's just like, yeah, yeah. A lot of, a lot of people do actually, I probably will try to send my mom a Dick Blick gift card because she's an art, she's artsy. It's where I get my artsiness from is my mom. So let's go to Sphinx while we're talking. It's a madhouse in DC. Yeah. It, I believe it's a madhouse out there, DMV. Just, there's so much crazy going on in the country in general, but Oh, yeah, I would not envy you. I mean, you, I used to live up um, up north of Baltimore, and we'd drive down through D.C. when we went uh, went down to Virginia to Paint Club. And, uh, yeah, I could see I could see how it could get just crazy. Thanks, DMV. Thank you. Yes, I enjoy. I'm, I'm uh... yeah, exactly, Kernico. Yeah, like, why, go, who, why would you go to a pharmacy unless you desperately needed something from the pharmacy? Because, yes, sick people. Um, yeah, you, everybody, I think a lot of people have a love hate relationship with Amazon. Right. And, but I'll say, I mean, dog father for all that there's things I wish they did differently. Like they are saving our bacon during these lockdowns. Like they are seriously, we owe them a debt. Like we owe them a forgive some of the hate, I think, because without Amazon, I'd be so screwed. Hey DM, how's it going? I have a DM Sultan, a DMV and it's like too, many DMs, many DMs. 
Yes, exactly. Many many painters have trained for this lockdown. Yes, you've got it, Rax. I actually am looking forward to getting some painting in um, this uh, holiday weekend. I, I am going to make a duck for Christmas dinner, but other than that, oh, and I'm making, I'm doing a pork roast tonight, a Chinese five spice one. But hey there, Bob and Julie. Julie, of course, summoned magically um, <laughs> because I'm painting a model. Not really. You've been here a lot lately, Julie and Bob, which is really cool, actually. I like seeing you guys. So, all right, we have a Sphinx, and I'm going to work on jewelry today. So let us think about, I think I'm going to highlight some of the blue and turquoise. Or should I do that? I probably should do the gold first, just to get the gold picked up. Yes, yes, exactly. When Bob and Julie arrive, it's a party. We can officially get started. You got it. But yeah, oh, hey, guys, I want to show you something. For those of you who are following the Targaryens, and they're all like, they're all like shiny and done now, but I want to show you Aegon's back. So I have dragons. Dragons. So the dragons got done. That was the last thing. So today I have to take pictures of those and uh, get them over to Jim. So those are uh, from Dark Sword Major. All right, where is... Come here, cat. Sit, get, stick on camera, Sphinx, while I get my colors. Colors. Where is... And you could use... I, I mix... I'm going to use a really yellow gold for this, guys. And we're going to use um, the reddish gold formulation, too. Yeah, Karniko here, let me get them all out. Not that I'm supposed to advertise Dark Sword on our stream, but, you know, like, Jim's our friend. So that's his sister. Oh, I gotta fix focus. Yeah. So his sister, and she's just pretty plain because her, her cloak has a lot of folds. And then his other sister, who has the dragon on her chest, and I did a little bit of the symbol on the back of her cloak. And then Aegon. So yeah, those are the three Targaryens who started it all in Westeros. Um, let's see here. Where is my... Hmm. Aha. So we want to be really yellow with this. We want to go also really red with this. And I have to put on... I have to start making a list of paints to reorder. Like, I thought I had extra of my russet brown, but or not my russet brown, my ruddy leather, but I think I need more. So I'm going to need to uh, do a Reaper order. Yeah, thanks, Kurniko. It's uh, the black NMM was really a challenge because it's so hard to make it stay dark enough. Um, fairly. I mean, what I'm doing is I'm mixing in this to some more standard NMM colors. So for our very red here, let's back out a little bit so that we can look at all our bottles. So, so what we do, my latest recipe for NMM gold is kind of a combo so I do rich leather and uh, usually go down to in this case I'm going to be shading with some ruddy leather because I want that red tone that Egyptian gold tends to have um hey Estelle thank you yeah she's cool so these are the colors we'll be using so rich leather um we'll be doing a bit of ruddy ruddy uh oh, not russet brown ruddy leather for shadow if I have to get a darker shadow, which I usually do, I'll use either brown liner or probably black and brown. Sometimes I use russet brown. It depends. Um, but then my intermediary color is a mixture of these two, actually. Mostly this with just a touch of that. And then uh, my last highlight is going to be a mixture of these two and then go up to white. But I put a drop of lantern yellow in every single color just to warm them up because this is... It'll give you a kind of muted gold. Uh, if you if you use the the base triad, the NMM gold triad, it'll give you a, a, a really a solid gold. But I like my gold, uh, especially with Egyptian stuff, I like it really yellow. So I add a lot more yellow. And the yellow that I choose is lantern yellow because it's more of an orangey yellow, so it's warmer. So now that we've got that out of the way, let us make some, some paint puddles. Yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, not too bad here. I feel okay ordering paint here with with uh i mean it might pass through frozen frozen states but i'll take my chances I'm not going to do a big order just in case you never know if it all arrives and it's trashed then i'll just have to conserve my ruddy leather thanks aristelle these are easy though like julie sculpted these eyes really big aristelle so i mean they were they i mean it's still hard to do like the highlights and stuff if you you got to develop your brush control right but but because the eyes are so nice and large, it is easy to do a colored iris. Um, so that's something that uh, the sculpt just makes a lot easier for you. She has really big kitty eyes, and that's uh, that's much easier to paint um, than small eyes. 
And it's about the minimum size that I would do for a colored iris as well. All right, so now I'll show you guys my mixes here. So let's see, we've got our russet brown. You can just see that off to the side. Now for my middle mix, instead of using this, the middle um, NMM gold color, which I could do, but you're gonna see this actually turns out very similar to that color. For some reason, I just like to simplify my mixes. You guys all know that, right? And I like to kind of simplify the number of colors I'm using also. Um, so I do a lot of mixing. So that's three drops of the NMM gold highlight. You know what I'm gonna do four? Because I do the four to one mix usually. And then over here, we're gonna do about two drops. And then I'm gonna start adding in my lantern yellow. So this is four drops of rich leather and I'm gonna add one drop. Remember we always use at least four drops in the, these wells. So this extra yellow is gonna give me some extra drops. This is five drops already. It's four of the NMM highlight plus one of rich leather. Now I'm gonna add a drop of lantern. Over here I've only got about two drops of the NMM gold highlight. I'm gonna add two drops of lantern. Um, and then I'm going to actually add a drop of pure white to this as well. And the reason is I still want it to be, hey, thanks for the resub trouble. Awesome. 11 months, you're almost your subversary. Grats, man. Or, or, or woman. <laughs> I never know. And who knows if trouble is male or female? Probably both. Trouble could be either. But anyway, um, since this lantern yellow, you can see it's darker than the NMM gold highlight. And I still need a fairly light color for my highlight. So I am going to, to counter that, I'm going to put in a drop of white to counter that lantern. Uh, and then we're going to go up to pure white because that's what we have to do. So four drops of pure white. And that is our palette to start out with. Now, let us mix it up. Uh, where's, a, where's a mixy brush? Mixy brush, mixy brush. Well, I guess we'll just use this. I really need to order like some cheap mixy brushes. I guess I could use my flat. The problem with using too big of a brush for mixing uh, up your paint is that it, it, a lot of it, you lose a lot of the paint, right? Because it clings to the bristles, but you don't want to wreck a small brush. Okay, so what I'm doing here, you all know I thin my paint fairly much off the bat, but this is my base color. So what I did is I added just one drop of water to my shadow. Actually, I'm gonna go back on that. I'm gonna add two because I know that ready leather is a lot of coverage. But to my base color, I'm only adding one drop of water. And then when I go up to these highlighter colors where I know I'm gonna want them thinner, I'm adding two drops. So I'm adding two drops of water there, two drops of water there. Uh, so that's almost a two to one, a one to two, no, two to one, sorry, uh, of paint to water. These actually have five drops of paint in them, so it's a little bit lower. But, and then to the white, I added four drops of water right out the bat because I know I want it thin and I know it can take it. So, uh, Crowley with NMM, I never ever use anything but pure white. NMM is the one thing that you always use pure white. The reason is that a shiny surface is going to have the brightest possible highlight. Bleached linen is the near white. If you have no other white on the model, it may work just fine. But um, it just, the other thing is it doesn't thin. It's not as, as um, excellent as pure white at, as far as being thinned. I don't know. If I were you, I would just go with a white. I wouldn't go with an off-white. Bleached linen has yellow in it, which I guess could read just fine, but it also has brown in it and a little touch of black. So you are getting those other pigments in there. Um, it probably wouldn't matter just flat out, but I always, I tell people because the biggest problem I see with people's NMM is, is one of two, and usually it's both, is they don't go down to a dark enough shadow and they don't go up to pure white for highlights. And without that pop of pure white, you lose the shininess. So... I always use pure white, Crowley, always. Like you will you will notice, like there are times I will use bleached linen if I am like highlighting white cloth, but I will, uh, that's like an exception where I won't go up to pure white, but white cloth doesn't like, it doesn't, I don't necessarily need that pure white highlight. I sometimes do, but you know, it, but with metal, metal's reflecting the light and the light is always where the brightest highlight is, is always very close to pure white. So yeah, it's, it's your choice, but if you ever show me uh, NMM for feedback and I, uh, I say, dude, like you need better highlights, then switch to pure white. <laughs> yeah, most common NMM mistakes, not taking it up to pure white or not shading far enough down. And often I see both on the same model. Mix up all our paint paint.
there are definitely exceptions and in most cases i mean i used to never use anything i, I used to never use pure white for anything i used to use um vallejo linen white for everything and that was a, an off-white very similar to bleach linen um but i've been taught since then and it has been like told to me by innumerable mini painters who i respect that you should always use pure white for highlights and i tend to agree so all right, we went very, very warm and yellow with this, so, and it's not noticeably lighter, so I do need more white on this. But notice how that uh, rich leather plus NMM gold mix turns out to be very similar to a yellow ochre, to the color that NMM gold um, midtone is. So essentially, I'm just... Uh, it is. It's even more so an NMM crawly because you are totally depending on that like juxtaposition of light and dark to create that shiny illusion. So it's even more important in NMM that you get that extreme contrast because that's what shiny objects do. They go from light to really light to really dark very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, so you can, you can sometimes skate by it on some other surface. Uh, and a lot of uh, people are doing realistic paint jobs on bigger busts. You're going to notice like if they're doing like a cloth texture, they're not going to bring it up even close to pure white. Uh, sometimes it's going to be, uh, you know, full step or two off, depending on the cloth type they're doing. Like wool never gets bright highlights ever, um, or super light anyway, even in direct sunlight, because it's so soft and the surface is so irregular. So you're also dealing with the type of surface that you're, that you uh, are trying to convey, right? Which we don't think about a lot on 28 millimeter because you can't do a lot. Um, on 28. You can do a little more on Sphinxy, on a model like Sphinxy here, because she's a little bigger. So monsters actually offer more practice on textures for 28 millimeter. Bye, DMV. It's okay. We'll miss you. You'll be back. But yeah, it, pushing highlights and shadows is, is uh, a big one, Crawley. And usually it's either that uh, they are afraid that it won't look good or it, their blending isn't really good and so it's too abrupt and they're afraid that that isn't going to look good. But in reality, if you block in your shadows and highlights, even if your blending isn't great, if their shadows and highlights are in the right place, your model will look good in general. All right, so what do I want to do? I need more white for this color because it does, does need to go from a dark to, dark to light transition and these two are too similar. So on the other hand, looking at these together, I think I want a little bit more yellow in this one. I could, I could stand a little more intensity there because I want a really rich gold. And really rich gold is really yellow, really yellow. So I'm going to shift that color more toward the yellow and I'm going to shift this color more toward white. I want to be able to see difference between my steps. Let's check in the chat. And I do have a lot of yellow load in here, so it may be a little more difficult to get this to shift. I may need a couple of drops of white. When you're starting out with a lot of paint in the palette, then it can be difficult to shift your colors. It gets more and more difficult to shift your colors because you're fighting against what's already there. So that's nice. That's warmed up my color. Now it looks a lot like NMM base. Um, the difference is that this is going to have a little less coverage, probably, because it's not got ochre in it. Or it does have a tiny bit of ochre because there is a tiny bit of ochre in NMM gold highlight, but it's not as much. So now we can see a, a definite light dark shift here, which is more like what I was looking for. All right, let us grab, what brush shall we use today? We shall use tiny brush because we are working on tiny things and we need to uh, precisely put our paint where it belongs. So I'm gonna pop this out of the frame and get Sphinxy in focus. Get in focus, Sphinxy. Get in focus. Focus E Sphinx. Focus E Sphinx. There we are. Good. There we are. All right. So finally, we could kind of look up. I probably should have looked up what vultures actually look like <laughs> on that one side to make it um, more uh, more vultury. I probably just need a head and a beak, right? So I'm going to start with my first highlight and I'm going to start just kind of picking out details. Um, yeah, I don't know if we can really suggest a vulture head there. We could at least uh, suggest kind of the shape of the head. And I'm going to, as again, as I've mentioned before, with a very small brush like this, you're going to have to reload a lot. You're going to have to go and get fresh paint a lot. 
the advantage is that you are capable of doing much finer work. So I'm just gonna, it actually looks more like a duck, <laughs> but but it kind of does look like a bird now, so I'm, I'm okay with this uh, particular vulture. I'm gonna grab some of my shadow. The other thing small brushes are not good at is wet blends. So if I want to do spot wet blending, I'm either gonna have to do it on a tiny scale here, or I'm going to have to uh, switch to a bigger brush. So let me grab, actually, I do want a brown liner, I think because uh, I do want to fix some of this muddy muddiness up here. I don't have a stark line between my red. Yeah, but you saw them up close and it's the wrong sort. The Egyptian vultures look a little different. I mean, we have the black vultures up in Denton and they're almost pretty. I kind of like them. Let's see here. I'm just going to get a bit of brown liner mixed up here because I want to be able to line spot line where I have uh, blorfed in the past or where I've been imprecise. Morning, dragon. How's it going? We're sphinxing today. We're doing jewelry and I might do some shadows on the stone. I was thinking about the stone and I kind of want some bluish shadows in there since I'm trying to make it look more like she's under the sun. So I was thinking about that. So I may actually add some more cool shadows just for fun. All right, so I'm gonna fix this little line here and I'm going to make sure that the uh, neck of the vulture stands out from everything around it. Kind of come in here and slim that down a little bit. The cobra on the other side definitely looks like a cobra. So we are, uh, we're good on that side. Let's get our other highlight here and try to get this neck kind of to come out on this side. When you've got little features that are so tiny, like these little heads, just do your best. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be like, oh my God, I need to be able to tell that's a vulture, you know, from 50 paces, paces or anything. Just, uh. Do what you can to bring out little features. Like, you know, there's a beak, right? So we can accentuate that there's a beak by highlighting it. And we can kind of leave a dark space between the beak and the top of the head, which will help to separate those two things and make it look more like a bird. If it was an animal, we would do a stripe down the, the middle of the forehead, right? But here we want to separate those two things. So you can do little tricks like that. Just think of sketching and what your key features are that you're trying to bring out. Concentrate on the key features. And you can see I'm having to reload my brush, like pretty much after I apply paint, I go and I reload my brush. And so I'll have to rinse very frequently also because this brush is so small. Um, and I take some pure white too. So you see how the little head is coming out? Yeah, she's here in chat, Pendrake. But yeah, it, it was, she thought it was, she thought she remembered it was Vulture. I mean, she slept since then and she like sculpts a ton of figures for Reaper. So it looks more like a Vulture. When I look at it, it looks like a, like a bird to me. It does, it's definitely not a serpent. I don't think it's a crocodile. Like could you could, it's general enough. You could paint it as a crocodile, but I decided to go Vulture. Got a little bit of highlight there. Really, you see how those little popped highlights when you're doing uh, the other thing you should know guys is when you're doing NMM on such tiny little things as this don't sweat the details like you there's not enough room to do a full you know highlight with a shadow under it and an under reflection you have to generalize when you're doing tiny little things like this the important part is that shadows are present and highlights are present in the right color and then the fact that you do the full NMM treatment on the rest of the model then will make the viewer see these as the gold that you want them to see it so you're not trying to be super precise on all these tiny gold details. It's impossible. It's just not going to happen. Um, so just don't freak out about it, essentially. Like in the middle of these tiny bands, you're probably only going to be able to suggest the highlight in the middle and bring that up. 
And again, it's the NMM treatment on the bigger parts of the model that is going to make this carry successfully. It is a vulture. Thank you, Julie. There we go. So we got a little bit of a brighter highlight there. We can put a shadow right under the vulture or leave a shadow under the vulture because he's going to block the light going to that little circlet right under there, that little edge. Um, so we can take advantage of that and grab some of our ruddy leather. Kind of put a little, little shadow in there. Probably put a shadow under the cobra as well. But we can go in and hit that little... Um, oh, my blur and hit that little um, place where the crown comes down kind of between your eyebrows. Yeah, I remember that movie. Ah, the sharpness of the beak. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and it's gonna, right? It's such a tiny detail. It's, um, I can see how it would soften in the bones material. But considering how nicely the rest of the sculpt came out, I think that's a, that's a relatively minor detriment. Most people are going to be more concerned with the Sphinx herself than the, um, the decoration around her anyway. Although it's always nice detail. But I don't think it's a deal breaker that one little part is soft. Hmm, I need to shift my seating here. <laughs> there. There we go. So I got a little abrupt on that little, that little circle. It almost looks like a little link. Uh, so I need to fix that a little bit. I need to blend that highlight in a bit. Yeah, that's what this is, uh, Twisted Oma. It's got both. So phased it out a little bit. Gonna grab a little bit more of a bright highlight. Kind of get that kind of going there. I may kind of make some midland highlight to go. I feel like I need to suggest more of this. Twist a little. Yeah, there we go. That's better. So even though there's shadow here, I'm gonna just make sure that there's at least a darker gold. I can always shade it down a little bit more. That was a little bit too much. Yes, she definitely has sass, the Sphinx. And again, you guys can see, hear how often I mix, I'm uh, thinning, or I'm sorry, rinsing my brush. So this is when you have tiny brush, this is what you have to do. The payoff is precision, and you don't have to worry as much about accidentally flooding an area. But there's a lot of extra rinsing and reloading to do. getting uh, that little bits of detail coming out. Yeah, here, let me bring the cobra out. Then it'll be evident there are two critters. You can be forgiven for uh, not noticing the two critters. Now here we have to emphasize the stripe of the belly and then the hood on either side to make sure that those details come out. 
and again tiny brush is really good at this because it gives you precision I did it looks like some of my paint didn't quite carry on top of the head here so I'm going to go up here and uh, make sure that parts of this are painted in you can see there's a kind of a little bit of gray back here so I'm going to come back and get that in the Cobra's coming out Thanks, Aristel. Twisted Oma, I think I could I can answer that one is uh, when I see Bob and Julie there there are the remaining sculptors that still like working in green for the most part. Uh, I know they've looked at ZBrush. But uh, I don't know that I don't think they're trying to change over could be wrong yeah Julie if you have if you have an answer on that one last I checked you guys were still very much in the green stuff world which is good because you know it's a tradition in miniature painting and somebody having somebody who can teach that still because it is what you use one second while I adjust my seating here guys my back is giving me trouble today so I'm going to readjust a bit make sure that my posture is correct there we go The problem with ZBrush for me has always been that it's so hard to learn. Real sculpting, much more satisfying, she says, Pendrick. I could see that too. Like there's some tricks you can pull with the ZBrush, but there's something about working with your hands too. There we go. Yeah, I haven't seen Wapple's glue method with green. Be careful if you're ever going to put... Be careful with using anything anything called glue if you're ever going to sculpt something to be uh, put on mold, however. Uh, I think that uh, Kevin, our on-staff Reaper sculptor, would probably rise up with an awl in his hand or a very pointy, nasty weapon and threaten you with it. Uh, super glue, I remember... Super glue turns liquid in molds. Uh, so the sculptors who would... Uh, put parts of their models together with super glue and not cover them over entirely with green essentially it would ruin the whole sculpt when it went into mold making so be aware there are downsides if you are uh, if you are thinking about putting something on mold to using types of certain types of glue which I know some of you do like to get things like made but I guess nowadays it's more likely you do it for 3d printing but A little bit more highlight here. There we go. The crown is now starting to come out nicely. Ah, Bob likes having an original of the sculpt. Yeah, I could totally see how that would be a thing too. That would be nice. You know, you'd actually have a record of everything you'd sculpted. It would be kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, Bobby doesn't use green anymore. I know he's really embraced, uh, Bobby Jackson uh, has really embraced the ZBrush. I like having both schools represented in Reaper sculpts. Um, one thing though that Bobby, I have heard Bobby Jackson say about it, you guys who are interested in all this, is that he does find that uh, ZBrush does look too artificial and he has to often go back in and add flaws to his ZBrush sculpts, like sculpting marks almost, to make the model look more real, to look less artificial and fake. So that's something also that green stuff, you know, the re the realness of the sculpt when you're doing green, you do get more of that artistry and the artifacts from the sculptor, the little imperfections, right? So Well, the thing is Jabberwock though, it's it's not sad for for them because uh I mean I'm no spring chicken myself, but the sculptors, you know, as they get older, as you get older with this hobby, it's harder for you to do the detail. And what ZBrush has opened up for 
um, for Bobby and for Jason, I would say, maybe for Gene, I'm not sure. Um, but it essentially allows you to keep going and even improving and not worry about not being able to see the details as well or to execute them because you can zoom in, you can turn the model, you can do anything, right? Uh, and you don't have to worry about putty curing time. You can work on it in 3D infinitely until it's right. So it isn't, don't, don't entirely think of it as sad because when some sculptors that are really brilliant and get older, they, ZBrush may be actually a really good tool for them. Yeah, older eyes. Well, Jason has said that, right? Like he was just, his eyes were getting old. He was missing things like, like fingerprints and stuff like that. Then he got into ZBrush and, and Jason's sculpts have exploded. Like they're amazing, you know? So. Hey there, Absalon. Yeah, happy solstice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it gets harder on your hands. Exactly. Yeah, so, so not entirely uh, sad. I think, I mean, Jabberwock, when it comes down to it, yeah, we it's it's great, you know, when we can still do, like, this stuff by hand, but uh, it's also great when, when a sculptor who might feel like they're losing, you know, their capability gets a new life with um, being able to do the 3D things. So, like, I'm just wowed by Jason's stuff. Like, I always liked Jason's stuff before, but now I'm, like, just super impressed. Like, he's got, the man has chops. And I know he's excited because sometimes it lets him bring visions, you know, some of his visions that maybe were too big um, or, or too weird, lets him do stuff, you know, that he felt he couldn't do in green. Or at least not do easily. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, there you go. So you're, you're, uh, you're my age group, Mighty Jabberwock. It takes time, right? And I mean, I've lost my eyeballs. That's why I use the readers. But happily, my hands are still pretty good. Yeah, Jason uses ZBrush. All of Jason's stuff for the last few years, I want to say. All right, I'm going to go in and put a darker uh, center, kind of flood this area behind the little serpentine symbols with dark so I can get those to really stand out. I could use black for this because it's probably onyx, but uh, brown liner will look close enough. Probably. Yeah, mini painting, sadly, uh, if, if my... Uh, if my hands go, I'm, I'm screwed. There's no ZBrush for mini painting. <laughs> uh, I still have my brain. I can write about mini painting. Oh, hey, I have exciting news to share with you guys. You can paint in ZBrush. Yeah, I could learn to do that, right? Ah, I see. 3D, become a 3D painter, huh? I don't know if it would have the same satisfaction, though. I, like, I have to say that, that at that point, it's like the satisfaction of doing the work physically is half my, my love. Um. <laughs> and before the show's over, Jason sends around a picture of, like, dire toilet paper. Yes, exactly. <laughs> It's just, a, it's a different experience. It's a different experience, right? But yeah, so, hey guys, hey guys, I've got, I've got exciting news. So you remember that on December 1st, just like, you know, even though I was kind of a coward, I did, I followed through on my promise and I sent out my, um, my query letter about my novel to my first choice of literary agent, which is these days you've got to apply to the agent. You can't just send it to the publishers. It gets tossed in a big slush pile and nobody sees it. So the agent got back to me. And wanted to read the first 50 pages, which is an amazing sign. That's uh, pretty darn awesome. So even if she ends up not liking it, um, I know that my query is okay, right? Because it worked to get me in the door. Um, and, you know, so 
yeah, so I know that my query is okay, and now my writing has to, and my first 10 pages are okay, because that's what the original query was accompanied by. So now my, my writing has to stand, right? So now we'll see. Well, I wasn't accepted, but, you know, she wants to see the first 50 pages. So now, essentially, she liked my writing so far, but she wants to see how I'm carrying the story and how my writing is, you know, not in just the first, the hook section, so to speak. So, essentially, when you're submitting to agents, getting a, a request for a partial, which is what this is, is big. Like, you're like, oh my god. Normally, you just get a rejection. <laughs> so, cross fingers for me, everybody. Um, but yeah, this is, like I said, even if she decides to pass me by, um, I at least now I have useful information. I know that I don't really need to rework my query. Um, and if she decides to pass on it, maybe she'll give me some feedback on, you know, what exactly lost her. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. It's cool. I mean, it's Christmas. I probably won't hear back for a couple of weeks yet, but, and the turnaround time was pretty good. Like my initial... I wanted to send it to this particular agent because I really have always felt that she's a great fit for my writing. Um, and so I only sent it to her because normally if you do simultaneous submissions, you have to, you let the agent know that you've sent it out to more than one person. Yeah. It, it, what it does mean is that I've been seen, right? Twisted on my, it's, it's that feeling of, yes, now they, they actually, my writing is good enough to have gotten their notice. I have their attention. And that by itself is rewarding. I completely agree. So yeah, so that was exciting and cool. And I still have like a hundred more literary agents to submit to after this one. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, this, this agent just, uh, she has, uh, she works with an author who actually inspired me when I was a teenager. Like I read this author's book when I was a uh, teenager and it was a lot like the stuff that I now have gotten into writing. So I, it was a logical approach there. Yeah. So now we'll see. Yeah. Now we'll see how it goes. Like now my writing gets to stand on its own, right? That's what that, and, and I have a lot of confidence in my writing. You guys always know me as a mini painter and a paint line designer, right? But in reality, I've wanted to be a writer longer than I've wanted to be either of, you know, those things. I did mess around with like a lot of chemistry stuff when I was a kid, <laughs> but I always knew I wanted to write stories. So, uh, this is definitely a cool, cool step, cool step. The next 10 could just be out flat out rejections and I'd still feel pretty good. Um, I don't want to, Aristel. If I get an actual offer of representation, then there's a timeline where I'd be able to say, because um, if, if I give you the author's name, you'll know who the agent is and I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it. So ask me and, you know, ask me after she's rejected me. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, you, you, I don't know if you, you're pretty new at all. So what I write is I write um, fantasy based on, on folklore. So I, I call it mythic fantasy. I don't know if that's an actual term, but my novel, current novel and its uh, sequel are uh, based, set in a world based on Norwegian folklore. So there are Northern bear Kings. There, there are beast Kings in general, and there are like, you know, trolls and, clever foxes and things like that. And the magic tends to be very organic, you know, as it is in fairy tales and folklore. There's a lot of enchanted objects, but actual magic in the world is, it tends to express itself through innate object, uh, innate magic of beings and items. So, or at least that's, that's how you're starting out. So, yeah. I love, uh, I grew up reading mythology and folklore and all sorts of books of, of, uh, and stories, um, uh, of old myths. And I, uh, I always loved it. I loved it. Like the monster manual, <laughs> it was one of my first, fa my favorite books when I was a kid, when I was like first getting into D and D because they it would, a lot of the monsters would draw upon actual mythology and I would recognize them from that. Um, so that, oh, that got me like even more into it. And I always liked, um, I always wanted to run, uh, 
is it Pathfinder Mythic? Is that is that the one where Pathfinder kind of takes some of the the rules from rules, quote unquote, traditions from folklore and mythology, and kind of applies that to Pathfinder campaigns? Ooh, kickboxing! You're fit, dog father. Wow, good job. Um, I, she, I don't know if she does, she does a bunch of different, um, she's done, she's tackled various things. I think I know who you're thinking of, in which case I think the answer is no. Um, but it depends. A lot of the authors that, let's just say, okay, let's say this Aristotle. This is a top agent, a senior agent at a top New York literary agency. This is not just some literary agent out in the boondocks. I went to the top. <laughs> like, the next two people on my list are heads of their own long-standing literary agencies in New York. So I'm starting at the very tippy top. These agents, you know, represent best-selling authors, multiple best-selling authors. Because why start at the bottom? That's one thing they taught me at Viable Paradise, which is the, um, the writer's workshop that I got into ages ago. But they're like, yeah, there's no reason to start at the bottom. You should never downgrade yourself. Start with your first choices, your absolute dream agents, and then progress. So. Yeah, everybody's got a little pandemic weight. I even put on, I put on a little bit. But. Yeah, go for the gold, right? I mean, there is, I, I followed the same theory when I was doing, working on short stories. Which I did actually to kind of fine tune my fiction skills. Um, and it worked actually. A lot of people say that short stories won't, aren't really useful in working on your writing skills if you're a novelist, but I have to disagree. They did actually really help me because you have to tell the story in such a short period of time, right? You don't have a whole book to set things up and knock things down. So I found it was really useful in tightening my fiction and some other, some other, taught me some other good lessons too. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you like yeah, submitting to like people who aren't as big like or 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 Aristotle, if the the lower tier snap you up, could you have done better? You know? So I'm not going to aim. I'm not the type of Anne to aim low. I never have been. Even though it's scary as blazes and you were laying yourself open as a as a writer and you know, even as a painter when you enter a competition, um, you know, you're laying yourself open to rejection and that's a, that's a super scary thing for humans. Uh, and it feels terrible. And so, you know, if I'm going to get rejected, at least I should get rejected by the best. Dang it. Uh, right. Exactly. Twisted Oma. And I've, to be honest, guys, I've been wanting to be a writer for so, so long. Like since I, I think I was eight when I started wanting to be a writer, like I was an avid reader as a kid. Once I could figure out how to read, you know. Like, I was already a good reader in kindergarten for my age group, for sure. And, like, a few years after that, I realized humans actually wrote books. And then it was like, yeah, I was going to try to be a writer, so. And I have a lot of confidence in my writing. I put a lot of work into it. I put at least as much work into my writing over the years as I put into becoming a miniature painter. So what we're doing here, speaking of, getting back to the topic at hand, is remember we're doing a kind of an alternating bands of light and dark. Um, I do want like some dark right next to the light, like down here, uh, but up here on the shoulder where it's more perpendicular, I can get a little bit farther away. Oh yeah. Well, that's hard though, Aristotle, like writing good nonfiction, good, clear nonfiction that's still entertaining and not boring. Like that is, um, well, in research papers had to be so meticulous. Like, so that's a serious talent too. You know, don't downgrade yourself. Fiction is always what was always my love, and it's what I started trying to write early. So, I've uh, had a lot of time to get better at it. Right, Nomad Zeke, right? Aim for the top, and I got like I said, I've got another hundred agents on this list to uh, apply to. So, I believe, I firmly believe, even though I know you know it's a, everybody tells you what a long shot it is for traditional publishing to get in. But I firmly believe that somewhere out there is an agent that is going to love my work and want to represent it. And whether we can sell it, that's the question, right? But just getting that far would uh, do a lot for me. 
And then if you if you got an agent, you know, but they just can't sell the book, at least you know that your work is good. And if you do decide to self-publish the book when you, you know, if you decide to pull it off the market, um, at least you know that you have a good book, right? Guidebook to a program. 800 pages. Too entertaining, Valandar. <laughs> See, nowadays... Yeah, yeah. You read so much that you can't think of anything original. Ah, but that's the key, though, Aristotle. Nothing is original. Sorry about that delay there, Aristotle. Do try to keep your language on a lower level um, and try to avoid overt profanity. I passed it this time, but but we're trying to keep kid friendly. <laughs> My little nephew watches this show sometimes. He's not that little now, actually. He probably is taller than me. Knowing the genes in that family, my sister-in-law is, is like six foot and my brother is six two. So I imagine both children are going to be immense giants and far taller than me. But uh, but yeah, my, my nephew does watch this show every once in a while. So just a, just a request to, to try to keep the profanity uh, tuned down. But yeah, Aristotle, there's like, the thing is that nothing's original. Like, you know, I base, my work is, is springboarding off of folklore. That's certainly not original. There is one other author that has tried to kind of, that has done a book, a successful book, actually, based loosely around the folklore, the specific folklore tale that I, that is at the core of mine. So it's not like I'm being original and trying to do a story based on this, but it's the details that are original, right? That's where you reach for originality. It's like... Oh yeah, red links. Like becoming just like a, you know, becoming just a doing writing for your job and being able to sustain on it is really rough, right? It's a, yeah, absolutely. Like I kind of have an advantage in that I'm more or less <laughs> I could I could still get better, but I'm more or less like doing okay with my painting job, right? So like my Patreon, thank God, thank you all for being my patrons. You keep me going literally. Um, you know, and the, and the, you know, the freelance the commissions and the um and the streaming. Uh, on my my D and D stream, like all those things, like give me a foundation. So now, if I'm springboarding off into another freelance, yeah, you know, I'm already working for myself in one. <laughs> so, oh yeah, oh wow, yeah. There's all so many more amazing female writers out there now. Twisted Omar, right? Is don't you love to see that? Finish lore from the Kalevala. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. You know, there's got to be something, Valandar, out there. Somebody's got to have tried it. But maybe not, you know, maybe it just wasn't a real marketable book and so it didn't get, like, I can't believe that nobody's done it. Yeah, right. Tashi, you have a totally good point, too, is that too much originality, if you depart too much from what people are familiar with, then you lose them. Uh, so you've got to have something that's familiar but fresh, which is the challenge, right? It's the real challenge. Well, then you just change a little part of it, Aristotle. Like, we all do that. Like, I can't have read every single fairy tale novel out there in the world of creation, but I'm pretty sure that my take on it's going to be creative. And if I do discover that I've copied something, then I can twist it a little bit. Yeah, because that's the key. It's like, there are so many books out there, right? But at the same time, those are books that people have already read, and maybe they're looking for something that's kind of like what they already read, but they would, you know, that just is a little bit different. And so that's where you come in. Everybody's a little bit derivative. It's just the way it goes. I realized I have a, I've lost a little bit of uh, paint here. So I had to mix, try to mix the color to uh, cover over it. There we go. Sphinx, you got a little bit of rub off. I had to had to quick mix uh, a fix. Yeah, Tashi, I agree. That's that's just too much. Like, and you as a writer, the other thing to remember, Aristotle, is that you as the writer may feel that it's a little bit trite. And you should always double check yourself on that. But always get a second opinion. You always have to give it to it like a beta reader or two and see. Um, that kind of thing. Ugh. Yeah, that's and that's where everything gets really muddy on with the fanfic, right? That's why if uh, like I I was in a I was at uh, 
a panel with George R. R. Martin once, and uh, people asked him if he read, like, if he kept up with the forums on his fan site, and he's like, absolutely not, and and they were like, well, why? And he's like, because it, I might be tempted to be influenced by them, and I, this is my story. I want to tell it the way I want to. And everybody out, out there is throwing out all these ideas and they're throwing out all these, you know, all these plot lines that might be real or might not. They're, they're doing speculation on what this character is really up to. He's like, I can't afford to even read that. I've got to I've got to keep writing from what is in my head. So he's like, so I, I just don't follow it. And he's like, I'm sure it's really entertaining, but but I, I have to keep telling my story. So, yeah, exactly. Right. But there are people out there that will take those ideas and run with them. Oh, Muay Thai, that's serious, Jabberwock. Like, doesn't that break your body? Like, Muay Thai, isn't that really hard on you? Like, I knew a kid, uh, well, a younger person who did it back when I was in Wisconsin. It seemed like it was a really hardcore. Yeah, exactly, Valendo. You have to be, that's why I think, I, Gurum is a smart guy. And uh, I think his, his attitude is correct and i also like the attitude of writers who don't even read their own the reviews of their book it's like the book is either selling or it's not and reading your own reviews is either going to give you an inflated opinion of yourself or it's going to make you depressed <laughs> hey val meetings are stupid i agree now you hit people with steel swords well you know if you're going to go from muay thai to something else at least it's sufficiently hardcore <laughs> hard hard to the tune of steel core <laughs> All right, so what we did here, guys, see, it's a simple uh, simplification of the NMM um, color sequence. So we have a bright highlight followed by a dark shadow, and then we're highlighting up toward the bottom here. See, we did the same thing on this side, although I lost my shadow there, so I'm going to bring it back in. Make sure you always have, this is, this is where you're simplifying, but you're still sticking to the basic rules of NMM. So you still want that bright highlight with a dark shadow right underneath it, and then an under reflection. And then these little shadows down here are also, because there's a curve, you're going to see kind of the same uh, rules of, of a cone, right, of, or of, of a cylinder. So you've got this rounded area, and the light is going to tend to hit right in the center of that and then diffuse. So yeah, I mean, there, there are several examples, right, that, that a fan fiction that was turned and tweaked enough, enough to become uh, top sellers. So unfortunately, that encourages that practice. I, I though, I don't know, I am a very much of the opinion that, you know, go out there and get your own IP. Don't steal other people's. It makes me really pissed off when somebody tries to um, profit off of somebody else's IP that they spent all the time to develop and market and, you know, make popular by their effort. And then somebody else comes along and just wants to make money off of that with no effort. And it really makes me mad. It's one of my shiny red buttons. I agree that it gets uh, abused in the other way also, but I still feel like, ugh. Yeah, exactly. Well, and there's a ton of, and even now, actually, who was it that I just came up with? It's the writer that I'm reading now, Rachel Kane. She is the first female author that I have yet, that I had yet run into who was a bestseller level author who d was not forced to change her name to write a male protagonist. Like, I'm sure that there are others out there that I just didn't spot up till now, but I'm still from the era of uh, J.K. Rowling, C.S. Friedman, um, uh, uh, what's my other, C.J. Cherry, who all were, were forced or, or strongly suggested to use initials with their last names instead of their female first name because one of their protagonists or their main protagonist was a male and it was felt that they wouldn't be taken seriously. And that always tweaked me, too. So the fact that, yep, Ursula K. Le Guin is a very much a big exception on that one, Valandar. Ursula was probably the first. That's a good good, good remind me. Um, but, like, I don't know how she got away with it or if she just told them she wasn't going to play ball. But uh, I, I know CJ talked about it, and I think um, C.S. Friedman talked about it at one point, too. Yeah, see... But happily, it appears that publishing now is realizing that, hey, just like male authors have been getting away with writing female roles, badly, <laughs> badly sometimes, um, for ages, uh, women can write convincing male characters. So, right. Yeah, technically, although 
there was talk also that like I studied that book in, in uh, literature class in college and they said essentially the only reason she was initially taken seriously at all was because of her husband who of course you know was a famous poet like essentially at the it, Shelley and Byron and all those people would get together and they'd read their fiction and then she would read a bit of her book and it was like oh you're so cute <laughs> like they didn't take it seriously and then she ended up outselling all of them Andre is her real name, but Andre is also a potentially a guy's name, so they probably wouldn't have pressured her to uh, change that one. But I know I've I've read about I've read um, interviews with writers talking about that and how ridiculous it is. But it seems like it is no longer a thing, and that makes me happy. That said, my my author name is still my initials because I actually like how it looks. All right, so here on the uh, chest, we've got that sharp delineation between the highlight and the shadow. Now we have to bring up our under reflection because there's going to be a reflected light coming up at the bottom here. So you see that under reflection there. Yeah, exactly, Tashi. All sorts of weird stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, and publishing has the weirdest ideas, right? And it's not, they're not always, like, true. But what you gonna do? Like, that's corporate, corp I say corporate America, but it's corporate world at this point. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people have been done dirty by Hollywood. I mean, I've heard stories, too. It's Hollywood. That's why, uh, why Gurma, he used to do Holly, he used to work in, you know, in television, and uh, he got out to be a, a novelist as soon as he could uh, make a significant living at it. Yeah, Nomad Zeke, you know what I got? I got uh, downgraded and not given a medal in poetry reading for forensics because it was felt that the subject matter of my poetry that I had chosen to read was too masculine for me to read it. That's the 80s for you. We have made some progress, you know. We have made some progress. But yeah, that's what that's what it was like when I was a kid. Yeah, see, yeah, Aristotle, you totally get it. Yeah, anybody who who thinks that, you know, the 60s fixed everything, let me tell you, as a girl who loved Rudyard Kipling and the Jungle Book in high school forensics in the late 80s uh being told that she couldn't read one of her favorite authors it wasn't suitable for her oh wow aristelle yeah that's ridiculous that that should have been a parent high school intervention right there yeah the 80s right well being welcome to dream crushing bs in the school system and there are you know for every dream crusher there is an excellent teacher who encourages you right I was, uh, I had one of those, too, so. And I, I think that's just, like, the world and humanity. For every, like, awesome neighbor you have, you're gonna have a person that just doesn't seem sane. And for every, you know, um, you know, fantastic, you know, business uh, opportunity you get, you've also got one of the crazy people who don't want to pay you what you're worth. And, you know, it's all, it, it, it's all out there. It is really hurtful when it happens that early in your life. It definitely teaches you a lesson, and you definitely either... There there are ways you, you learn to react to it, right? Like, for me, I got mad. <laughs> yeah, back then it was, it was, like, it was starting to twist a little bit, right? Twisted Oma, but we were still, um... Like, at least they didn't mind if I read it, you know, aloud at home, or if I read it at home, they just didn't want me standing up and reading it in front of a class of people. They didn't feel that was suitable. But I loved the Jungle Book, and I really wanted to read some of his poetry from it, because, you know, it's well, mostly prose, but he also did poems. And I loved them, so, because I love animals. And I also really, I mean, he's, he's a, uh, Kipling was a rhyming poet, but I actually liked that when it's cleverly done. I know free verse is more the 
way things go these days, but. Yeah, yeah, and you're just never going to change them. You're never going to change those people. Like, you just got to, in fact, you just should not even engage with the crazy at that point, in my opinion. You just do the best you can not to engage. All right, so I've got that highlight there underneath, and that's what makes that look shiny and reflective. Um, I could bring the highlight a little bit more up, but I can see a little bit of it. As long as I can see it, I think we're pretty good. I can blend it in a little bit more and make the shadow a little bit smaller. There we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Aristotle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty lucky, too. There were just some times like that. But because I was overall lucky, I was able to look at that time at that forensics tournament and uh, get mad instead of getting depressed or discouraged. Which is pretty much... Uh, the way I try to greet things like that, injustices. I mean, there are times when you just can't, you just can't engage because you're not gonna, there's not, it's not gonna do any good. Learning, learning uh, which, uh, which fights to take is important, I think. I think our current climate is a great example of that is the polarization and people believe very strongly on, you know, various topics and, and you just, you just aren't going to dislodge them and maybe you shouldn't. I mean, you know, you never know. It's not really your, your role. Like if somebody, if somebody has a, a belief that you think is just core wrong, I mean, it's really their own responsibility to change it. It's not your job. So unless it directly starts, you know, legally infringing or harmfully infringing on you. Yeah. Learning when to fight. I learned that at Reaper too. <laughs> There's only so many things you can do. There's so many projects you can follow. There's so many, uh, so many like things you can, you can champion, you know, so many ideas you can push. I think it is important to, to direct your energy in the best way for you and to not get mired down in negativity. It's very hard, very difficult not to be negative. There's a certain seductiveness about it. I even have my moments and I'm a pretty chipper person, but there we go. Got the other one coming in there a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you can turn it around pink, that's uh that's the best, right? Oh no. <laughs> yeah, that is funny. <laughs> It's not like I can give you brownie points. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Here, let me get some red into these. Uh, I forgot that we need some red into these shadows to make them a little richer. Bring in some reddish tone. <laughs> and that's a good one. I don't I don't hear about it. And that's very often. At least not in the USA. It's not like and there aren't many ands either. Like, Anne is one of those names that's perpetually kind of lurking out there, but never gets super popular. Which I'm okay with. I mean, in when I was in school, Jennifer was the name, and there were like four Jennifers in every class. It was ridiculous. So, I'm okay with not being a terribly popular name.
let me get that under reflection in there you can see it coming up you notice how my highlights and my reflections are rounded guys because this is a rounded shape so it's going to get rounded highlights and reflections and shadows yeah yeah it's popular as a middle name i almost was an elizabeth ann instead of an Anne elizabeth it was close apparently it was a close thing <laughs> i'm actually pretty happy that i was an Anne instead of an elizabeth My mother's middle name is Anne. Although mom has like one of those archaic cool names nobody ever has anymore. My mom is a Lois. Three other Aidens and a Caden and a Hayden. Yeah. You just never know, right, Chibi? I'm John Charles. Oh no, Valendar. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Parents, what are they thinking? Yeah, every third child was Chris growing in the, yep, in the 70s. I had a lot of Chris's also in my uh, classes in the 80s, 70s and 80s. Yeah. Well, and we, we know that, you know that if you're like somebody like me, who like where there's more than one variant of your name. Although I think the Bryans have it worse. And poor John, uh, Reaper John, you've got it bad too. You've got the, the J-O-N, which I always thought was a cooler spelling anyway, but which, you know, is usually the last spelling people go to, it seems like. I'm trying to fine tune some of the shading now. Wherever I kind of look at, it, whenever I'm working on something like this pretty organically with NMM, I'm always kind of evaluating, do I need a heavier shadow? You know, does this, is this shape wrong for the surface? That kind of thing. Thanks, French dad. <laughs> oh, oh, Tashi. I'm sorry. Haha. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron's, yeah, lots of Aaron's, yep. Ha. Oh, yeah, Ajax is one that uh, hasn't uh, taken off. That's a cool name, though. Plus, you can be a Jax or a Jack if you want to. That, that gives some options, anyway. When I was in school, there was an Alexandria and a Cassandra. I was very jealous of their names since I was so into mythology. Apparently their parents were as well. But of course they were Cassie and Alexa or something. Oh dear, Robin. Uh, everyone tries to call him AJ. Oh, uh, yuck, AJ. Ajax is so much cooler. Yeah, Phoebe, exactly. Odin, that's a good one, Poidel. Does he hate you for it? <laughs> or does he like it? Hehehehe. <laughs> I mean, there are some kids that revel in their unusual names. Mostly not, but every once in a while you do get a one that, that does. Needs a pretty strong personality, though. Because it's hard in school when you get picked at, picked on. Cousin has a Thor, wow. Oh, Gunner's a good name. I like Gunner. I, th I think that's close enough to mainstream that it's not bad. Plus, it's a cool-sounding name. I don't know if you'd get made fun of for that one. Although, I guess kids can find any way to make fun of you. If they really want to. Kids are wicked and evil. I know, I was one. But actually, I wasn't a very, I wasn't a very evil child, because I was on the uh, 
the weird side of the totem pole. So I was more the outcast gang. There we go. There we go. We have boobs, guys. Look at that. With under reflections. It's great. Now we got to get in here and do some of this gold, which is kind of in shadow. So it's not going to get a lot. <laughs> Would have been Loki. Yeah. Ah, uh, he does prefer Thomas. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, as he gets older, he may like his first name a lot. Like, it'll be a talking point, right? So we'll see. Oh, poison. Yeah, poison ivy. Yeah. Yeah, they, I mean, kids just like to make fun of other kids. It makes them feel like they're safe. If you're ridiculing people, you don't get ridiculed. Or at least that's the theory, I guess, right? I don't know. I just always hated that part of kid culture. I just wanted to read my happy books. I, I read all the time when I was a kid and draw. Trying to touch up some of my lining here. And we are getting uh, a lot of our NMM gold uh, mapped out. Her, her top part is looking uh, pretty shiny now, guys. Pretty shiny. Almost named, named Athena. Wow. Well, and shortening it to Athena. Athena isn't, I mean, it's an unusual name. It's not terrible. Ah. Briggs and Tenley. Briggs? Yeah, my, um, my nephew is Graham, which is an old-fashioned name, too. I kind of like it. There we go. Get some of that highlight down there. Just a little bit. Aislinn. Yeah. Yep. I can't, can't call anything a Loki. <laughs> yeah, I think naming people after trickster gods probably is asking for trouble. Like, I don't think I would do it. <laughs> Putting some red shadows in the, on those under bits. There we go. A little bit of highlight. Probably a little bit too much. It's bad enough for a cat. Yeah, right. I can't remember my bullies' names either. Like, I can remember what they what they looked like. I learned how to diff diffuse them though in high school, and that was that was cool. Because uh, when I saw them in a the hall, I would compliment them on whatever you know, t-shirt, hair, whatever. I would always be nice to them, and that totally disarmed them because then they would look like real jerks if they were mean to me after I publicly like told them that their hair looked great that day or whatever. So I learned I learned sneaky ways of getting around it. Oh dear. There we are. Got just a little bit of light down under there. You don't want it to be brighter than the under reflections, so I may need to tone it down just a little bit because it's all going to be reflected. So I either need to bring a little bit more to the um, under reflection here to make that more in line. Yeah, that's probably what I'll do. Just to make sure that it's consistent. You want your light to be consistent. Yeah.
My high school was pretty tame. There were, there were, I mean, it was rare to see a fight, like really rare. Like I can remember like two fights in the entirety of my high school, I think. And I would be never the type to get into that sort of thing. There we go, a little bit more accentuation, and then we've got really shiny breastplate. So we've almost got, let's talk about how to do this. Let's see, what are we at? Oh, we only have like five minutes. All right, so let's talk about our, our armband here, right? Because it's a, it's a cylinder, it's going around her upper arm. So we're gonna make sure we've got a nice solid base coat on it because some of it may have a little bit of rub off or I may not have put it on as strong as I needed to. And your highlights on a cylinder are gonna be going, actually, now that it's wet, you can kind of see, but your highlights on a cylinder are generally gonna be at the four compass points. Um, so you're gonna have one going directly down the front wherever the light sourcing is. And then you're gonna have a secondary on the side because as you turn the model to the side, that's what you're gonna see. And then you're gonna have another one toward the back and where it goes under her arm, you aren't gonna have anything. Um, but normally cylinders highlight like that. They'll go a bright light down the middle and then shadows and then go back out to highlights. Yeah, it's nice when you can get a super, super chill kid who just isn't bothered by it. Now I'm doing my lining just because if I have to go back and do my lining after I do all the highlights and shadows, I've got a higher chance of screwing it all up. So we've got lined, we've got stuff. Now we'll do our front highlight. And since we have a highlight coming down straight down here, we know that highlight's probably gonna go and hit the top of that bicep. So it's gonna be here, here, and here. And uh, it's gonna go straight down toward the ground. The arm is out a little bit to the side guys here, but we're gonna make the highlight go down and just block that in with pure white. Honestly, it'll be more of a spot highlight, but right now I'm gonna have it like that. The wing actually goes out and back, so it's not gonna interfere with these highlights. It, her wings don't curve around her, so the wing goes out. So it may overshadow this one, but you're still going to get some bounce light. And probably warm bounce light, too, because um, the wing is going to be a cream color, probably, or a warm gold. Light, light gold but the underside's almost certainly gonna be cream. So we could put a certain number, a certain amount of highlight here and assess it after the wing is in place. But it's still gonna be spaced correctly. It's still gonna be like quartered. If you, if you cut this into quarters, this ring, and at each like point, you put a highlight of some sort, you'd be about right. And this varies depending on where your light sourcing is and where the front of the model is. I mean, if your model is more turned like this and the light was coming down more like this, then my first highlight would be here. Um, so it, it varies. Always look at what your vantage point is. Wanna put a little bit of shadow in here. Get that red brown rich shadow in there. A little bit there. There we are. 
is a little bit of a highlight in here, but just a little bit of one. This is more like a mid middle color, middle mid-tone color. You want that band, that shiny band effect. So you alternate a little bit. I'm going to shrink my highlight and actually bring it a little bit more toward the front. Bring the shadow up right next to it so it's more shiny. Reaper Challenge League. I am not familiar with the Reaper Challenge League, John. Tell us what the Reaper Challenge League is. Is it painting challenges? I bet there are people in chat who know. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I've been talking with the community about this for a while. Uh, this is the Reaper Challenge League. Uh, basically, there's monthly, quarterly, bi bi-yearly, and yearly challenges. And you complete those challenges to earn points. And then you can spend those points on raffle tickets that we do. We're going to do a raffle at the end of each quarter. Um, so this is a good system for people who don't either don't have a lot of time to paint or have a lot of time to paint. Uh, so it's a challenge against yourself and not really against other people. That's why I like it. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of rules because each of the challenges take a different, uh, they all have different submission processes and stuff like that, but it's meant to be more fun and less strict. So the rules right. are kind of loose. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's Very it. Cool. Well, thank you for letting us know, because I didn't know. So now I know. Yay! Knowing's half the yeah. battle. All right. Bye. Bye. There we go. The voice of the John. Yeah, so here we are just, like, pretty much, like, doing some alternating bands. And you would do a lot of the same thing. You guys will see this on. Oh, as I drop my brush. Oh, no. One second. Lost retrieve brush. Oh, there. Brush back. Um, but hold on, I put my, I put my, I managed to get my earbud to work again over the weekend. Um, so, ah, and I'm also going to break my chair. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so you're going to see this on things like swords too, right? Where you have alternating bands of light and shadow, right? And that's what that does is it simulates, um, features in the environment that are going to be blocking the light and things like that, as well as the shape. Link to the Discord. There we go. Sweet. So yeah, so now what I need to do is I need to get some pure white and really pop that highlight right there on the front. And I want to do a spot highlight because I'm trying to say that this gold is really shiny. So that means your highlight is going to be sh tiny and sharp. You don't want it to blend necessarily. You want a spot. I got a little bit too much water in my brush. There we go. And I'm going to bring this up just a little bit higher. I want a little bit more light there. They're shiny, shiny. When when you look at your NMM, look at it from more more from more than one vantage point. So, like my first viewing angle is going to be face on, and I'm okay with it on the face on front. I feel like I need more shadow pushing this highlight back farther though, just from the way it's looking. So I'm going to do that. I need a broader band of shadow. Push it back a little bit more. Doop. Now I like how that looks from the front.
and then pop another white highlight in over here though I may choose to make it a downplay it a little bit um, depending on the wings and how that works but I want it to read okay on the side we'll see how the wing positioning comes into that if I had the wings next to me I could do kind of a dry fit but for now I'm just gonna block it in and if I have to change it I always can shiny 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 hey dog father all right, so that's that's doing well. We all we need uh, we need to deal with uh, some of the NMM down here. Um, we need to fix some up here. We didn't really finish uh, blocking in our our gold up here on the top. <laughs> Crazy cat time. Oh. Any news on the UK travel ban impacting orders from the UK store? No idea. That would be a, a Reaper John question. He probably would have to check with Kit over there to see. Unless uh, something has been said before now. I mean, there's still not a mailing ban. But I don't know if they are allowed to leave their homes or go to work or whatever. I'm gonna use some lining. I've kind of lost the shape of this, uh, the V shape of this uh, breastplate down here in the fur. So, ah, okay. So yeah, John will check on that. Just a little bit muddy here. Probably need to paint plastic surgery it a little bit where that this comes down in a v-shape but it goes down into the fur so it's very hard to get that uh, shape defined without doing a little bit of paint plastic surgery no Aristotle this is how I do it if I want to make a really bright color like up here when you want to do tiny little bands of like lapis and turquoise like I've got up here or even the red carnelian um, I put down white first and that makes the red or the blue or the turquoise show up brighter when I put that color over it. So it's a sneaky way to get tiny little bits of color to show up better. Yeah, I'm just trying to accentuate a little bit of a shadow underneath this so that I can bring in a highlight and make it stand out a little bit more. No problem. We try to answer. If, if you have a good question, we try to answer it for you. Reaper's customer service is very good. It's always been very good. All right gonna get kind of this little area down here I'm just gonna highlight all of this I think and then I'm gonna put in shading just to see where my problem areas might be so I'm just gonna put down light color first just to get that area defined you can see it now ah sphinx I forgot that I hadn't pegged her in Usually she sits pretty well, but I've been hand handling and playing with her enough that she probably decided she wanted to flee. The Sphinx is like, I'm done. The Sphinx is like, it's time to call this stream. <laughs> who are we raiding? She says. <laughs> so, Justin, who are we raiding? Uh, let's see. So we got some NMM guys done. That's a, that's pretty much what we did today is gold NMM to get the Sphinx's jewelry looking nicer. Um uh, while Justin looks for a raid, I'm going to just recap what we did. We did the little animal on top of here. We talked about how you're just going to do basic NMM rolls up here and try to carry more of a uh, the real like effect on other parts of the NMM. I still haven't done the little eagle or falcon bit in the middle here. 
Um, but uh, I've talked about rounded highlights and shadows and how you deal with cylinders with NMM. Um, and then the, ended up just saying probably we'll do um, more of this and some highlighting on the colors uh, next time. So what do we got there? We're going to be reading Jimmy the Brush. Thanks, Julie. I'm glad you like it. All right. Jimmy the Brush then, guys. Have fun. Say hi to Jimmy for us. And I will be back tomorrow morning. Have a great one, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. We'll see you guys this afternoon for Miniature Monday. Don't change that dial and have a great rest of your day.